Hello, Internet, and welcome to Ramblings of a Madman. I'm Alex, and I'm joined by Sean and Stuart for a shallow and probably uninformed dive into the world of unexplained mysteries, conspiracy theories, and the supernatural. We're here again. Hello, hello. We've returned. We've returned. And we're here for our 18th topic. You know that what that means, guys. The podcast can drink. Yes. <laughs> I had no idea where you were going with That's how it works, that. right? <laughs> He's been waiting 18 episodes to say that. <laughs> An episode is a year, right? That's how it works. Might as well be at the rate we... <laughs> the rate we part out, yeah. Uh, right, so as always, we'd appreciate it if you give us a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. All links are available on our website, ramblingsofamadman.podbean.com or on Twitter at Rome Podcast. And the showing's out the way, got it done Ooh. very early. Get him! So we're going to start with the, the episode, which I had a lot of fun making. Ooh. Enjoyed this one. Okay, okay. Ooh. So I want to do something a little different and dive into mythology this time. <gasps> Ooh, all right. Oh, so, left, left field topic, I like it. Do you guys want to talk about dragons? I would yes. love to talk about dragons. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking nerd! <laughs> I'm trying. I'm try, I, I am enthusiastic about it. Don't get me wrong, but like, <laughs> how do you well, feel yes, I would, about I would love dragons? To talk about dragons, yes. <laughs> but I want to focus specifically on why dragons are in pretty much every mythology throughout history in every culture. Okay, I guess okay. it's weird that they've all come to the same general idea of this creature. It's because they were real, right? Yeah, sure. There you go. Podcast solved. Solved. Well, it, it wouldn't be on a flag if it wasn't real. It's on many flags, actually. Bhutan's oh, well. got one on the flag. A dragon. <laughs> uh, I, I was trying to be like overly patriotic then, but I, I'm i speechless. I, I'm speechless. I didn't... There's actually another flag with a dragon on it. Yeah, Bhutan. Oh, okay. You said many countries. I'm sure there's more than, than that. Oh, okay. I don't know all the flags. I'm just quickly looking that up. Because if it ends up being a fucking, like a worm or... Oh, yeah, there's a dragon. <laughs> worm? <laughs> no, like a W-Y-R-M or a fucking... Or I mean, that, or that's a dragon, right? No, that is a dragon. I'm, I'm going to be very general with dragons in this episode. I concede that is a dragon. Yeah. Okay, so the earliest references we have to dragons possibly come from ancient Mesopotamia, as early as 2000 BC. In the Babylonian Epic of Creation, the goddess Tiamat gives birth to the first generation of deities, who later kill her husband Abzu and usurp his throne. Enraged by Abzu's death, Tiamat takes the form of a sea dragon and declares war on all the other gods. She was slain by the storm god Marduk, but not before she had fashioned 11 monsters to battle the deities in order to avenge Abzu's death. These include the first dragons, whose bodies she had filled with poison instead of blood. This trait is shared by many of the earliest stories of dragons, as opposed to the more modern characteristic of fire breathing. Ooh. Okay. I thought you'd like that, Sean. The D&D reference got in there early. <laughs> Tiamat, yeah. Tiamat. <laughs> so, the Hydra from Greek mythology was a dragon-like serpent with fatally venomous breath, blood and fangs, which was slain by Hercules as a second of his twelve labours. The creature had anywhere between five and a hundred heads, and famously grew back two more for every one that was lost. Hercules cut the heads off and then singed the stumps with flame, to prevent any new heads from growing. He then dipped his arrows in the Hydra's blood, and from that point on in the legend, he had a seemingly endless supply of instant kill arrows. (laughs) He must have been there ages just dipping arrows in his corpse. Uh, It's from the Greek that we get the word dragon translated from Dracorn, usually referring to a giant serpent that possesses supernatural characteristics. In the Greek succession myth, Typhon attempted to overthrow Zeus. The two fought a cataclysmic battle in which Zeus defeated the monster and cast it into Tartarus, which was the dungeon that held the original gods, the Titans. Typhon's appearance varies depending on the story, but it's generally described as a huge winged humanoid, with tangles of snakes extending from his shoulders and below the waist which comprise its legs. The snakes either breathe fire or poison depending on the source. So that's what I meant by I'm getting a bit loose with the dragons. Like, okay. that might be a dragon, or it might just be like a weird Naga person made of snakes. Hmm. Uh, dragons are also a prominent feature in Norse mythology. In the Icelandic Volsung saga, the dwarf Fafnir became overcome by his greed and transformed into a dragon. He breathed poison into the land around him so no one would go near him, near him and his treasure. 
Fafnir was later slain by the hero Sigurd, who waked the dragon's heart and gained knowledge of the speech of birds for some reason. <laughs> As you do when you kill a dragon. Yeah, not like the Not like you gain the, uh, the, yeah, the language of dragons, yeah. Nope, no, I just be birds go, specifically. <laughs> Look, it was very important to the plot. The next bit required him to talk to a bird. Ah, the plot demanded it. Yeah, Got the plot it. demanded it. Uh, this story closely resembles that of Smaug from The Hobbit, and so it's thought that this legend was Tolkien's main inspiration for the dragon. Mm. In Ooh. fact, the exchange between Bilbo and Smaug is almost identical to that of Fafnir and Sigurd in the story. Okay. And you go learning things, mm. as we always do on this podcast. <laughs> it's all important information which will help you in life. Stay in school. The more you know. <laughs> The similarity between these Western stories is that of the role of the dragon. It's the villain, a foil for the hero, a fearsome opponent to be slain. This message was further propagated with the spreading of Christianity around the world. In the Bible, dragons take on a more sinister interpretation and are often literal representations of Satan. Chapter 12 of the book of Revelation tells a story of the woman and the dragon. In it, a woman gives birth to a male child who is saved by God from being devoured by an enormous red dragon with seven heads, ten horns and seven crowns on each head. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and hurled it into the earth. Quote, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. The dragon then tried to kill the woman by spewing a torrent of water from its mouth, but she was saved by the earth. Enraged at the woman, the dragon then went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. So that's basically saying that Satan doesn't like Christians. And he kind of, like, wanted to kill them all. I mean... That's my interpretation of it, anyway. Okay. So, again, that's interesting. With it, it, Does it say the word dragon in the Bible, then? Uh, it's a translation. So that's from the Hebrew, the original okay. Hebrew ah, okay. Bible. So it's translated into dragon. Okay. So it's around this time that the aspect of fire-breathing dragons became more common. It's believable to think that such a feature came from the medieval depictions of, of the mouth of hell since it was often depicted as a literal monster's mouth, with flames and smoke spewing out. The earliest example in European literature of a fire-breathing dragon comes from the 10th century epic Beowulf. The dragon is described as a nocturnal, treasure-holding, fire-breathing creature with a venomous bite, so it's, it's got fire and poison. It's super powerful. In the tale, Beowulf defeats the beast with help from the kingsman Viglaf, but he ultimately dies from his wounds. In his death speech, Beowulf nominates Viglaf as his heir and asks for a monument to be built for him on the shoreline. But he didn't know that about Beowulf. No. No. <laughs> so, since me and Sean are Welsh, I figured we should talk about the tale of the red dragon that is on the Welsh flag. My hen, lad, von hard. Yeah, go on, sorry. Yeah, I'm sure you know the story well, Sean. Do you want to tell it to me? Wait, which one? The, how the Welsh dragon got on the flag. Uh, there was a red dragon and a white dragon. Yes. And they lived the, happily the, ever the, after. The red dragon won. When a mummy dragon and, and a this daddy is actually dragon. this is really annoying me actually because I, I really wanted to know this. It's on the tip of your tongue, isn't it? Like you know the story, but you don't quite know the story. No, I know. I, there's a load of different like Welsh stories that come yeah. together because you've got like uh, a Wanglindor and you've got um, what's his face the 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 king with his dog. Oh, was the the king with his dog? What's the dog called? What's the dog called? Lassie. No, it's uh, <laughs> like the, the dog um, defends... Yeah, the, oh, the baby. Oh, the baby. The baby. Is it from, the, yeah. from the wolf, Balen? but then they kill the Balen? dog. There's a place in Wales where he's said to be buried. It, it's his grave, but it, it's a Welsh translation, obviously, and I can't... Ga- Baith Gellert? Beth Gellert, yeah. Gellert. Gellert is the name of the dog, because Beth means grave. There you go. We've turned into a language podcast as well, apparently. Yes. <laughs> so... During the reign of King Thud, the peace is disturbed by a number of plagues. One is of a horrific scream that comes every May Day and causes all pregnant women in Britain to miscarry. It's a very specific plague. Thud goes to his brother Clotheris in France, which is a very French name, and asks him for advice. He says that the scream is caused by a red dragon that is wrapped in combat with an invading white dragon. He says that he must dig a pit in the exact centre of the island, called Oxford, fill it with mead and cover it in a cloth. The dragons drink the mead and fall asleep, and then Thud wraps them in the cloth and imprisons them in Dinas Emrys, which is a hillock in Snowdonia. Mm. So that's the very weird and strange tale of the Welsh dragon. Well, Hang the on. first part. I don't think that answered why there's a red dragon on the flag. Uh, no, it doesn't. It doesn't answer it at all. 
No, oh, no. Okay, great. Wasn't it? When you started that with, do you know the story of why there's a red dragon on the flag? What you really meant is, no one knows the story of why there's a red dragon on the flag. <laughs> why isn't it? A, why isn't it? No, a pink there, there is, there is, there is. The, the, they had a fight and they won. Yeah, there's a second part. And the red dragon won. Okay. There's a second part to the story, which is the sort of prologue of King Arthur. It's when uh, Merlin first gets introduced into the story. Okay. And basically, a king's trying to build his castle on top of Dennis Emrys, but all the walls keep getting knocked down by the screaming, because apparently they're still under their screaming quite crazy. And he finds Merlin, who at this point is like a child, and Merlin's like, uh, there's dragons under here, you should like get rid of them or something before you can build the castle. Uh, so he frees them, and the red dragon kills the white dragon, and then he builds his castle. That's my abridged tale of the red dragon. Again, it doesn't explain why it's on the flag. No. Despite the fact that it won the fight. Also, why, is, why isn't it taking revenge for the fact that it's been trapped underneath the cloth for ages? Look, the, 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 reason, the reason there's a dragon on the flag is because it's a dragon. And dragons are cool, man. And dragons are cool. <laughs> Apart from Bhutan, we don't we forget about them. We have a dragon on our flag. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> Apart from Bhutan. Ooh, Apart look at me, yeah. I got a red <laughs> Actually no, I'm gonna start a <laughs> start, don't start a, a war pa- with Bhutan. Patriotic war. No, I, I meant that <laughs> I meant England. It's just a view, you got a red cross. Ooh. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. So let's move on to the Far East, because there's, there's dragons there as well. Mm. Apparently. I thought that's where dragon, like the story of dragons would have originated from. Yeah, it does actually. Oh, well, there you go. I lied before when I said it was Mesopotamia. (laughs) Okay. So, yeah, because a lot of, um, in like uh, Eastern cult, uh, Eastern sort of like art and culture and like, uh, like specifically Chinese, a lot of the artwork that you see sometimes are like like tigers and stuff. There's usually dragons in that as well. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, uh, I don't know, the, I guess the stereotype of like Chinatown and sometimes the architecture, or you go to a Chinese, there's usually a red dragon on there. Yeah, it's like the Chinese New Year is the same, isn't it? Where you uh, yeah, they have a year of the, the dragon and stuff like yeah. that as well, yeah. Okay. Yep, but just as you said, interestingly, it's next to a real animal. So think about that. Oh. For a bit. Right, okay, because there's year of the dragon, year of the pig, year of the tiger, year of the monkey, mm-hmm. and... Uh, eight other animals. Eight and various other creatures. I, I could list them all, but, you know, yeah. I, I'm not going to. So, in contrast to the villainous dragons of Western mythology, dragons in Eastern mythology symbolise good fortune and are often water deities associated with rainfall and bodies of water. They tend to be much more snake-like in appearance, with long serpentine bodies, full legs, and clawed feet. The first example of a dragon that is present in Eastern history can be seen at Shi Sui Po in Puyang, China. This Neolithic site was excavated in 1987 and consists of 186 burials. In one of these, the body of a tall adult male was found, flanked by two mosaics formed from white clamshells, a tiger to his right and a dragon to his left. Thought to be 6,000 years old, this could in fact be the first depiction of a dragon in human history. Whoa. Hmm. Let me try and find a link for you. Ago. Yep. So 4,000 BC. And 2,000 years before Mesopotamian stuff. Well, Mesopotamia was around the same time, but the okay. one I talked about specifically was younger. Whoa. It looks like a Komodo dragon. It does. It it? It's, it looks... it's, a, it's an eastern dragon. They're like snaky, aren't they? Yeah, but it looks to me like how I would imagine a Komodo dragon would look if you got rid of all its flesh. It's a horrible thought. Oh. So that, that is a human, isn't it, lying down? Yeah, right. in the middle. What's the thing at the bottom? Though? It's supposed to be a tiger. Yeah, I can see that like being it. a tiger. It actually. could be a bull, I reckon, though. No, it's not. Like, it's tigers horse. aren't that shape. I mean, they probably didn't have a tiger next to it for scale to be yeah. when they made it. Have you seen old art? They're not great at drawing. Hmm. Also, the picture you've sent through looks like the body's being struck by lightning. Oh, yeah, it does, yeah. No, I, I don't think that really means anything. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> It's a podcast. We're meant to discuss this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to humour him. <laughs> <laughs> Screw you. Right. Alex, next. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so this mosaic resembles what you would think of when you imagine an eastern dragon. So therefore, unlike the slow development of dragons seen by western mythology, we can say there hasn't been much artistic evolution in the depictions of dragons throughout eastern history. Yeah, mm-hmm. whether that's I wonder whether or not that's an authenticity thing, that they're really strongly holding heritage over it and not having artistic flexibility. Yeah, might be. Like, culturally, they don't want to change how the art is for, yeah. like, social reasons. No, I, I agree with that, yeah. Like, I don't think it's a artistic flexibility thing. I think it's just that's the style that they've just kind of a lot of different artists have picked mm-hmm. as, like, representing the culturists, I guess. I don't, I don't know if... I, th- I think the the Chinese dragon sort of idea, at least in Britain, is probably used more as a stereotype and a way to... Yeah, I'm literally just thinking food and Chinese food. Uh-huh. And, like, it, it is kind of a stereotype, isn't it? Yeah. So I don't know how much... I don't know, because I'm trying to think of, like... I'm sure I've seen, like, pictures of the Imperial Palace, and I'm sure there's carvings or, like, little statues on, like, gates of, mm-hmm. yeah. like, Chinese-style dragons. dragons. all over the place. Yeah, so I, I, I don't think, you know, for me to say that it's a stereotype, I think by British standards it might be, but it's not seen as a stereotype. It's still, if you know what I'm trying to say, it's still an identity. Yeah. Well, I'll get to it now why there's so many dragons associated with China. Okay. Uh, according to legend, the earliest ancestors of the Chinese were closely related to dragons. At the end of his reign, oh, yeah, yeah. the first legendary ruler, the Yellow Emperor, was said to have been immortalised into a dragon and ascended into heaven. The other legendary ruler, the Yan Emperor, was born by his mother's telepathy with a dragon. Somehow, I'm not sure how that works. Uh, due to these stories, the Chinese Emperor gradually became closely identified with dragons, and eventually dragons were only allowed to appear on the houses and belongings of nobility. Uh... Any commoner who possessed items bearing the image of a dragon was ordered to be executed. Okay. Other Eastern cultures, such as Japan, Korea, and India, tend to amalgamate the dragon legends from China with that of their native mythology. Korean dragons have long beards, and they carry an orb known as the... Ye... Ye... I, I didn't phoneticise this word. Right, post it in chat. I'll... Yeah, post the spelling, we'll have a look. Yoju. Yoju? Yoju, I would say. Yoju? Yoju. Sure. We'll go with that. Ye- Yeju. You, 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 you. <coughs> that game's oh, honestly. Abe. <laughs> <laughs> Abe's honestly. <laughs> yo, yo. <laughs> ah, anyway, anyway, anyway. Right. Uh, I, I'm going to go with uh, Yoju. Okay. Korean dragons have long beards and they carry an orb known as the Yoanju, which is basically the philosopher's stone. That's not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded right in my head. You said Yoanju. Like, what's <laughs> yo- Where did the end yo- come from? <laughs> Yoju. Yeah, where'd you get the end from? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way Sean went. Yeah, yeah, I reckon it's probably Yoju. <laughs> so, so today's went, dragon okay. also refers to as Yeonju. <laughs> okay, what I'll do is I'll copy and paste you saying it over me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it won't you be... have received a message from Yoju. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, no, that's a good idea. Put that in. So say it now. Say it now. <laughs> I can't remember how you said it. Yoju. Yoju. I don't know if that's There's correct. There's an I though. You're, you're skipping the I. Uh, maybe it's French. So maybe it's Yuiju. <laughs> Luigi. Oh my god! No. Stop it! Oh, I'm absolutely hosing it here. Fucking hell. <sighs> Yoju. And they carry an orb known as the Yoju, which is basically... That's not what I said! <laughs> <laughs> All right, just, just, just... <laughs> <laughs> My voice went so high-pitched. Oh my right, Yoju. <laughs> right, leave the majority the, of that. I need a break okay. for a second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't see you. Too much tears in my eyes. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> Korean dragons have long beards and they carry an orb known as the Yoju, which is basically the Philosopher's Stone in their claws or mouth. Japanese dragons often possess fewer toes than the other Eastern dragons, with Japanese dragons having three toes, compared to the Koreans four and the Chinese's five. 
So just marginal differences. I suppose the other thing about that is... That's the, inbreeding, that is. The, <laughs> sure. Like said, the, um, the Chinese dragons, the fact that they've got five toes would be more in keeping them with them being humanoid in origin as well, or humans being yeah. dragons in origin. Yeah. yeah. That's a good link, that, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> good job. All right, I was being polite. You, that's the most sarcastic ridiculous sarcastic thing I've ever heard in my life, Stuart. <laughs> Jesus Christ, we're talking about dragons. And you're talking about... Oh, I don't know what I was going with. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do meme. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> right, carry on. So, did they exist? I don't know. What do you reckon? Right, I reckon from the point of view of that any animal could have existed, as long as it was scientifically possible, I guess. But, like, you get Komodo dragons. Mm-hmm. They're dragons. I mean, they're not. I mean, they're called Komodo dragons. They're lizards. You're a lizard. Right. They look... They, they, they're they obviously not dragons. They're not winged or whatever. But Chinese dragons aren't winged either. No, So the not. idea that you fly. could have, like, this sort of serpentine reptile could be a dragon. Yeah. It wouldn't necessarily breathe fire. I don't believe in any of that. But I reckon there is probably some kind of animal that is now extinct that resembles... It genuinely... Oh, wait, no, hang on. Komodo dragons aren't native to Eastern Asia. They're native Asia. to Komodo. Yeah. Fuck off. Yeah. No, no, they actually Wait. are. Mm-hmm. Oh, they actually are. Yeah, it's uh, Komodo and two other islands. <sighs> the, For the uh, first time in this episode. In, 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 in the, in the, to be fair, though, it's in Indonesia, so it's not that far geographically, realistically. Mm-hmm. For me, Wait, I there think... is actually a place called Komodo. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's an island, yeah. Oh, okay. The thing for me is that I think they probably did exist in how they're depicted. And I think there was probably another animal that was like a Komodo dragon. And I think they've got, obviously, that that small serpentine shape. They've got, like, what we think of as, like, a hand for feet. They've got proper claws, like talons, haven't they? Mm -hmm. But then the other thing about them breathing fire or spitting some sort of horrible corrosive substance is the fact that uh, a Komodo dragon's bite is... Awful. It's literally a death sentence. You get bitten by a Komodo dragon, and yeah. the Komodo dragon just follows you for basically like 72 hours until you Yeah, it's a die really, really slow endotoxin. acting poison, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, like, the idea of them having venom or that being elaborated to, to fire or them spitting that venom. Is it fair doesn't... to say that venom or poison can sometimes burn as yeah. an effect? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, maybe that's what people are thinking. Like, yeah. they don't literally spit fire, but it's like makes your blood spicy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, it's a, yeah, it's that. It's, that sensation that you're on fire because it's literally burning you from the inside. Yep. And maybe it was the, Yeah, that's exactly what I said to you, spicy burning. blood. Okay. <laughs> Don't try and apply science to it. <laughs> you would you think like you would think though that the whole the the idea of it burning, you might think that, that somebody might have written down an observation about that animal that maybe people didn't know much about, and then a character a description for it to say that the bite is like being burnt by mm-hmm. maybe yeah. The phrases, yeah. and rather than it being fully constructed language back then, it might have been uh, really important, just single words. Yeah. Yep. I'm inclined to believe uh, the side of like, okay, so I've, uh, I'm hesitating because like every, every time I take a breath and go, okay, so I usually embarrass myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, genuinely, Jurassic Park. Yeah. The little small one. With the, the frills. Like spits with the frills. I can't remember the name of it. And he and he spits the like that goo mm-hmm. acid stuff yeah. that burns what's his face. Anyway, you know exactly what I'm on about. The, yeah, him. Uh, are they obviously those are extinct. Were they animals were those little dinosaurs proven to have that ability, or was it something made up by Jurassic Park? Uh I is what I'm trying to ask. I'm not yeah. exactly sure, but I'd lean towards more made up by Jurassic Park. Okay, Since because the, Jurassic Park... The dinosaurs in Jurassic Park aren't that accurate anyway. No, and uh, it's come out recently that they might have been feathered. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the dinosaur, by the way, is a Dilophosaurus, and it was fictional. It literally is literally uh-huh. that it was fictional, uh, the whole spitting venom thing. Right, okay, so I'm glad I asked that question, actually. Yeah. I'm glad I asked that question, then. So are there any other animals that are proven to be able to spit venom? Well, because obviously you get poisonous snakes. animals. Right, yeah. we'll we'll get mean? to it. In the, I'm not at the furries bit yet. Oh, ah, okay, okay. I just want to see like your your first thoughts. That's all. I I think that 
I don't think they existed in Wales. Okay, sure. Considering we have no lizards and, like, two snakes. Exactly, yeah. Um, th- that's British wildlife, isn't it? Pretty like, much, yeah. Well, is there any... No, okay, I guess there would have been proof that there would have been different types of animal extincts. Now they they, sh- they would have found fossils and stuff by now, right? Uh, in theory. Well, in theory, yes, but they might not have been preserved very well. Yeah, okay. So if they were real, I don't think it was whales. Um, I think Eastern East Asia is like the most likely place because of everything we just talked about. But I'd rather retract that statement until we've heard the different theories. <laughs> okay, right. So since dragon mythology is so inter- intertwined with that of religion in many cultures, it's not a stretch to say that many people throughout history believe that dragons were actual creatures. After all, most medieval Christians literally took the Bible as gospel. I like that line. <laughs> ah, it took me a second. That was good. <laughs> Throughout history, scholars have written about dragons as if they were a scientific fact. Published at Zurich in the 1550s, Historia Animalium is a four volume encyclopedia written by Dr. and Professor Conrad Gessner that attempts to describe every animal known to the Renaissance people. In his work, he describes dragons as very rare but still living creatures. Quote, Close to the town of Buries, near Sudbury, there has lately appeared to the great hurt of the countryside a dragon. Vast in body with a crested head, teeth like a saw, and a tail extending to an enormous length. I'm not going to take anything he says as true. <laughs> okay. You're not a fan of Conrad Gessner? No, because his name was Gessner. Ah. I mean, it's not a valid reason for sure. Right, okay. The, the laughter that I did before, can you cut that into just after my joke? <laughs> or, or bring Stuart's or forward. Bring me in. <laughs> <laughs> the power of editing. On the Hunter Lennox globe, dating from 1504, on the equatorial line, near the southeast coast of Asia, is written the famous phrase, Hic sunt dracones, or Here be dragons. The globe, which contains the earliest known depiction of the Americas, was designed to be as accurate as possible. So why would such a phrase be noted? That's cool. Mm-hmm. So why, why do you reckon they'd write that on what was supposed to be like an accurate depiction of the Earth? Like, I'll give you a link of it. It's actually very accurate. Like, it's better than what I could do. So this is, sorry, okay. a map of the Americas, did you say? This is a map of the world. It's a globe. And it's the first one with the Americas on it. Ah, sorry, first one with the Americas on it. Okay. And who is it that's made this? Uh, an unknown Italian man. Okay, but a European. Yeah, European. Interesting. And it's thought to be based on Marco Polo's journey. Okay. Okay. So if you Google that, there's the globe and then there's the map version of it, like, turned into a oh, map. Yeah. It's flattened, yeah. Yeah. Whoa, that is remarkably accurate. Although, they're a little off with... I mean, yeah, they're a little off with a lot of it, but... I mean, Africa's pretty good. I mean, they've got South America there. Missing most of North America, but whatever. Hmm. So it's it's Latin, right? And there's yes. no way that that is the actual translation. That is of the Trichones. translation, yeah. So why is that in where? why is that in the language anyway? Where is it on the map? Where it's it on the equator in Asia. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. There should be a picture of it zoomed in somewhere on Google. Yeah, I think I'm looking at the wrong picture. It's oh, on yeah, the right hand yeah. side. Well, so it's under Ant. Amph, is that Amph or Ant? Vran? Antaron. Nixon Draconis, yeah. But then it says NM underneath it. I'm not sure about that. Hmm. Okay. But they're implying that in this area there's dragons. Now, whether they mean that literally or whether it's a figure of speech, as in, like, this is unexplored territory and we there could be dragons here for all we know, is debatable. I mean, it's obviously not perfect because they haven't been to North America yet, I guess, right? It's remarkably accurate. Like, to be fair, seeing, seeing as they didn't have Google but, there. But is that, like, here be dragons, is that, like, because they're literally, uh, artistically, they're everywhere and they're depicted everywhere? Or I mean, is it it's, because it's they actually had dragons? up to interpretation whether that's a literal yeah, of course, phrase yeah. or whether it's, like, it means we haven't explored here yet, so there could be dragons for all we know. So what about the rest of the stuff? Because does, does it say a statement like that anywhere else? Because as far as I'm looking... Uh, no, it doesn't. That's what I mean. So it looks just like names of places. Um, like you've got India and then India Orientalis. 
Um, there are various pictures around as well. India, extra Asia. Extra Asia. Ooh. Asia 2, Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> what? Have you not heard that game? No. Asia 2, Electric Boogaloo. No, it's Boogaloo. not called Asia 2. It's called Something oh. 2, Electric Boogaloo. Oh, no. I feel like I should now. It's a meme. They haven't found Australia yet. It doesn't exist. Because it doesn't it's... exist. Hey! There's a ship there instead. We're, we're leading up to the Flat Earth episode. We are. <laughs> it's interesting as well that it shows it in a like a hilly area and then it's next to the it's next to water isn't it so you mm-hmm. wonder whether or not it's a again like going on the is it a paraphrase of something else like was the sea really bad there and obviously we've already said the far east uses a lot of dragon depictions as water dragons you wonder whether or not there's a big there's a terrible area of land that constantly gets absolutely battered by the sea because of storm patterns and things and whether or not it's a a translation for that mm mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. So, also, the dragon is one of the creatures on the Chinese zodiac, but why is it the only mythological creature represented next to 11 other real animals? Did they think dragons existed, or is it due to the association of the dragon to the emperor? Um, That genuinely is a good point. Like, I'm presuming the Chinese might have, or many cultures might have had different ideas of, like, mythological creatures and gods and stuff like that. So why have they... Like you said, why have they put a quote unquote mythical creature mm-hmm. into the calendar? Like, I, uh, not the calendar, the zodiac, sorry. That's quite interesting, actually. Mm-hmm. I like that. So, I have three theories on why dragons are so widespread throughout different cultures. Uh, okay. The first is that we, we, what we kind of touched on it's the fact that dragons may be modeled after real creatures or phenomena. So it might be mistaken first impressions people had of an unfamiliar animal, or it could be exaggerations that people made whilst describing a foreign creature to someone else. Some possible creatures include the fire salamander. These black and yellow amphibians are widespread across Europe. They excrete poison from glands on their skin, which can be fired by the creature when alarmed. Although not dangerous to humans, this poison can cause severe irritation. Now, these are very small, though. That's a big issue with them. But, I mean, if you're describing that creature to someone and you happen not to mention the size of it... Yeah, I, d- I don't... I was thinking this before. I don't think size is an issue because the fact that the fire salamanders are so small and, like, from what we're just saying, I don't think that it matters. Mm-hmm. Because I was thinking it before in terms of, like, you could imagine a dragon being massive, right? But, like, a picture of it could be a small fire salamander. And, like like you're saying, like, if you get told about something... Yeah, and the size isn't told to you. You wouldn't really think about that. You might imagine, like, you know, anything. Um, and the fact that, for example, when that guy was buried, there was a depiction of a tiger and a, a dragon next to him. What if they were tiger-sized? They don't have to be huge. Yeah. Uh, in a lot of medieval artwork, they tend to be, like, sort of human size, like six foot long. Mm-hmm. Like, smallish like that. Are you sure the human just wasn't very tiny? Well, I mean, humans exist. I mean, I am one, and... Okay, that's a lie. We, okay, I'm actually... You're a lizard, we established this yeah, before. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's safe to assume that the human's the correct scale. That's all I'm saying in these pictures. Yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, obviously, obviously we can't assume that 100%, because they don't put a scale bar on it. They haven't put a banana for scale on it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, but if there's, like, different depictions and pictures of stuff of different animals and whatever, and if they're to scale relatively, yeah. and then you've got a dragon in that, and it's like six foot, whatever, long, then in theory, if they were real, that's how big they'd be. Mm-hmm. The only other thing that I'm kind of wondering is, it's a little bit more left field, admittedly, but you wonder whether or not when people are exploring these new territories and they're making these comments, you wonder whether or not these little fire salamanders are spitting venom at these people, but because they haven't really appreciated the fact that that's the thing that's doing it. You wonder whether or not they've seen a different animal and felt a burn from a salamander and put two and two together to say the animal that I saw has caused the spitting rather than a different animal causing the spitting that maybe lives in the same area. Mm -hmm. Like the example might be what happens if you see a really big snake like a reticulated python or something ludicrous like that 
and you get the sensation that your skin is on fire because you've happened to walk through a load of salamanders that are defending their territory. Yep. Mm. And you see the big animal and you go, oh my god, my skin is on fire. This animal is clearly the thing because of its size, because of its presence. Like, what happens if that was where the idea came from? Yep, it's perfectly There's valid. A, there is a statistical probability that that can happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, an interesting point I saw when I was doing the script for this episode was that imagine if you saw a bird carrying a snake and then you think the snake would be flying. I mean, it's a bit of a stretch. Yeah. Like, what if it was going past super fast and you only this saw whole, a snake? This whole podcast is a stretch. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, like, maybe. The large size and scaled bodies of crocodilians may also be the inspiration for dragons. This is especially mm. true for eastern dragons, since they were so closely associated with water. However, mm. the fact that crocodilians mm. were also documented alongside dragons makes this also less likely. Oh, damn it. Yeah, what if it's a different... Genuinely, what if it's a different species of crocodile, though? Yeah, it could be. But, like, crocodiles are quite commonly depicted in artwork and stuff, like Egypt, Titan, Nile crocodiles, things like that. Yeah, but what about Eastern Asia, China? Uh, they have Chinese alligators there. Is there an alligator on the Chinese zodiac? No. No, there is not. Then it's a crocodile. Yeah, the closest one would be the snake. Hmm. A, another possible creature the dragons could be, as you've already mentioned, are large snakes such as pythons. Since dragons have so many serpentine characteristics, it's likely that large snakes were the original source. Particularly the pythons, for example, can grow up to 30 feet. Yeah. I mean, that definitely fits with what I'm thinking. Well, but then I'm they're not imagining. limbed as well, though. Yeah, but you don't necessarily see it. Maybe they, they only saw the, the really long body of the python and assumed that these animals must have had legs because they're so massive. Mm-hmm. How would you get around without legs? That might have been the, the genuine question that they, had, they asked then. But you can imagine, though, definitely that... So the reason I'm, I'm saying that in particular is there's a particular picture that I'm looking at of the Chinese zodiac symbols. When you look at the dragon and you look at the snake, they look remarkably similar... Yeah. except for the presence of legs. Which, if a snake is going to be found in a jungle-like area, it's not going to be found in something that's plainly visible because the snake's going to have a massive disadvantage. Mm-hmm. So I would think that if you saw something that was 30 foot long propelling itself along the floor, I would assume it had legs if I'd only ever seen lizards before. Yeah. Or what if you saw it poking out of the water? Yes. Since yeah. eastern dragons like tend to be... Like a crocodile. Or, the, cro- or the snake was riding the crocodile, <gasps> and the crocodile was walking, and you could see the crocodile's leg. Or the snake had half eaten a crocodile and had legs to catch Oh, there we go. There we go. We solved it. Or a bird was carrying a crocodile. <laughs> that's that's probably it, actually. You've really roasted my bird comment, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> Something quite good to me when I was reading it. It, I mean, it does. To be like, to be fair, I can genuinely imagine like, uh, a, well, I think it has to be a pretty big bird pick up a snake yeah i'm, I'm, well, I'm not talking about no. python like a, like a small snake that bird was carrying but it was far away right so you can't really judge scale true but then if it was really far away how would you judge that there was a bird carrying a snake with binoculars Stuart. yeah i suppose ancient chinese binoculars oh that yeah the, the bird carrying a snake is completely unbelievable but ten thousand salamanders burning a guy <laughs> and then him seeing the big snake you know i think salamanders are solitary more. as well all Which right, is even more, even less likely. <laughs> right, let's talk about our good friend, the Komodo dragon, since yes. we've yeah. already talked about it in length. Uh, being the largest lizards in the world, this makes these creatures a good candidate for the inspiration behind dragons. The problem, though, is that since they are native to a few Indonesian islands, they were not discovered by Europeans until the 20th century. But that doesn't rule out eastern provinces. I suppose the point there, though, is so when... At what point did we see dragons in Western culture versus in Eastern culture? Because if Western culture just stole the idea from Eastern culture, which basically found the idea from the fact that they had their own native Komodo dragons, that doesn't seem a stretch to me at all. Based on the archaeological evidence, it seems to be that they came from China first. Yeah. And then they were in like uh, Mesopotamia, Egypt and Greece, those sort of places. Okay. Honestly, I know very, very, I know remarkably little about ancient China. But I always, yeah, me too. I always think of the ancient Chinese as being uh, like pioneers. Do so you think of like 
paper and fireworks and stuff that's like the Western society took much later. I wouldn't think it would be beyond the realms of possibility that the Chinese would have explored their local area enormously. Yeah. Hmm. Like, that just doesn't seem a stretch to me. If someone mm-hmm. said to me, the origin of the dragon is that the Chinese were exploring and came across the Komodo dragon, one of them got bit, literally said, oh my god, it feels like I'm on fire, and then died, mm-hmm. for them to be able to like, oh my god, this dragon, this snake yep. with and legs. And then they badly this... explained it to someone else. Yeah, and then it was like Chinese whispers, mm-hmm. which is obviously poor, well, I suppose good choice of words, poor choice of words, whatever you say. Sure. Or what if he was allergic to dragons and had a anaphylactic reaction? <laughs> very specific allergy. Hmm. I mean... Hey, what, hang on, some people are allergic to very specific things. Dragons being one of them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, we all might have dragon allergies that we don't know because we haven't come in contact. I mean, Alex, you almost certainly have a dragon allergy. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> What I mean is, your deadly allergy to pollen is probably equivalent to a deadly allergy to dragons. So, dragons are plants, is that what you're telling me? Yes. Because that's actually the next creature that we're going to talk about. Fuck off. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love it. You got me hook, line, and sinker then. Bastard. You actually did get him then. That wasn't going... A what? <laughs> that was you actually genuinely thinking that. <laughs> the next thing, though, is a bit out of left field, and this is comets. So... Mm-hmm. A comet streaking across the sky, after all, could resemble a serpentine creature flying across Mm. the sky. Okay. I suppose that would explain the whole fire element then, because if it's burning up as it lands and it hits the ground and it's on fire, Mm -hmm. you might be thinking there was a ginormous serpentine creature in the sky that's disappeared but left fire behind? Like I quite like that idea, actually. That's yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not thinking about thinking. the comet actually landing. I'm just thinking about looking up at the sky and seeing a comet with its tail going across the skyline. But for me, that the reason that I think that sounds believable is that if you imagine it as a comet shower and seeing something continue in the sky, but something also hitting the ground from a maybe a, a meteor... Um, not a meteor. Is it a, 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 well, a I don't it, know the what, difference. Do we call it a comet that hits the ground? Uh, I, I'm not sure. So you can imagine, oh, that's though... That's a stalactite. <laughs> it might reach the sky. It might reach the sky, yeah. You can imagine a trail through the sky of a comet shower and then some sort of object from space striking the, the Earth's surface and being on fire and putting two and two together to say that the thing in the sky fired the fireball. Yeah, that's pretty reasonable. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the second theory I've got is fossils. We all love a good fossil, don't we? We do. Best thing in the world. Uh, Dragons may be inspired by fossils that our ancestors couldn't explain. It's not a stretch to think that bones unearthed by people who had no knowledge of extinct species could result in myths. This is particularly true for giants and cyclopses. Cyclopes? Cyclopes? Cyclopi. Cyclopi, yeah, sure. As there are many examples throughout history of scholars saying they had personally observed the bones of giants dug from the ground. The first dinosaur fossils were unearthed in Sichuan, China, over 2,000 years ago, and were described by scholar Chang Chu as dragon bones. Ooh, that sounds really cool. Like, that fits in with everything. It does, yeah. Like, Ooh. you can imagine if you find, like, the skeleton of an animal, because, like, in my head, I'm thinking, compared to the local environment that they're in, Animals that die there would probably have been feasted upon, either consumed by human or consumed by other animals. So you might not get that many bones that are completely stripped of flesh unless the animal has been dead for a long time. And then you might just recognise the fossil, or the, the carcass, sorry. But if you find a fossil of a creature that's been dead for a long, long time, Especially by the time that they found it digging it up, they've probably disturbed the natural anatomy of it by moving bones around. I can definitely see how if you had like a snake's long body, obviously, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the fossil of a snake, but there's lots and lots of long, tiny, tiny, thin bones coming off the spinal cord. If you disturb Mm -hmm. enough of them, I could definitely see how you might think there's a limb coming off the side of it. Oh, yeah, definitely. And they get get squished during the the, uh, burial process as well. So a lot of them get deformed yeah so like if you if you then had like a snake's fossil with limbs 
that's exactly what the dragon looks like in that picture that I sent through. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, China is pretty famous for having sauropod fossils. So they're the the long neck, Diplodocus and those sort of dinosaurs. Ah, okay. And they have very big bones, very tough Mm. bones. Hmm. And they've but they've got four legs though, haven't they? They do, but I mean, often you're not finding the whole skeleton. You'll you'll find a tibia, you'll find a, a bit of the spine, you'll find a part of the but skull. I, suppo- I suppose if you found a considerable portion of it, you might see two legs, a long neck, and a head. Yeah, and think possibly. this is half a dragon. Yeah, you could. Also, what was the like? You said it was two thousand years ago. Mm-hmm. For him to have been able to name these bones as dragon bones, that in my head means that he must have had knowledge or thoughts of dragons existing in the first place. So is this before, you know, that uh, shell thing that you... It's after that. that So that was 6,000 years ago. Yeah, that's what I mean. So there's 4,000 years before these bones being found, where either the mythology or the knowledge of dragons existing, either one, would have been around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's probably like a... um like a snowball effect, isn't it? Where the idea of dragons has been discussed in the past. Maybe it's not been a continual thought, but then every now and again something crops up which brings the idea back to the forefront and it keeps growing and growing and it it escalates and escalates to the point where something that started off as maybe a fairly innocuous idea has become so embellished that now you've got a huge creature with four legs, with a very typical looking draconic appearance with a long tail that breathes fire. Like you can definitely see stories being embellished by the development of these, especially if people are, are then in high-profile cases discovering fossils and saying, "I found evidence of a dragon." That's going to be that's going to have so much hype around it, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Or I suppose it would now, at least. Okay. The legend of the Cyclops began in the islands of Sardinia and Sicily after people found giant skulls with single eye openings. It wasn't until 1688 that a scientist showed that the skulls came from an extinct species of dwarf elephant. So if you Google what? elephant skull, it looks so much like a cyclops, it's ridiculous. Really? Yep, because they have the big hole in the middle where the, the snout comes out of, and it looks Whoa. like a single ah. eye. Mad. So we don't need to do an episode about... Oh, it's sick. We don't need to do an episode on cyclops. No, it's done. Covered it in one sentence. That's really cool. So where do the eyes actually go? They go on the sides for elephants, don't they? Yeah, you can you can literally see the eye holes. On, on the picture that I'm looking at, the eye holes are at the side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can see that better now. Yeah. yeah. That is awesome. Alex's cool fact of the day. That is really cool, yeah. Yeah. A huge bone was housed at St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna in 1443. It was thought to have been a relic of a giant that had died in the Great Flood. You know, the one from the Bible. And pretty much every mm. culture as well. It's very similar to dragons, actually. It turns out, however, to be the leg bone of a mammoth. Oh. Okay. So that's less exciting. But they were like, they had this relic and they were like worshipping it. And it turned out to be a mammoth bone. Hmm. We still, it's still in Vienna as well, I believe, in the museum. Okay. Similarly, a dragon's tongue was kept at the monastery of Wilton in Austria. The tongue was thought to have been cut from a dragon that was killed in battle with a giant named Haman. It was, in fact, the nose of a swordfish. <laughs> okay. Oh. Swordfish nose. That's swordfish like nose. So what was the giant that he fought, then? That's the, the local legend. That's the local legend, okay. Found it. It's the, the Wikipedia article for the giant himself, Heyman. Ah, uh, okay. There we go. He's a big lad, isn't he? Oh, what, and they thought that was a, the dragon tongue in his left hand? That's a... I think that's a just a statue of it. I'm not sure there's a specific picture of the dragon tongue. Oh, I'm assuming that he the thing that he's holding, the long, thin... Yeah, but I don't think that's the actual one. No, 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 but that's depicting yeah, the yeah. fact that he was holding a long tongue that wouldn't come from any other yeah. creature. And there's also a, a, a black and white picture of it as well, which looks a lot more like a tongue below it. Oh, yeah, it really does. How is that a swordfish? I think they've made it look more like a tongue in the picture. Yeah. To sell the story. Heyman and the dragon with its tongue torn. Oh, God. Yeah, he tore it off. As a trophy. Why didn't he just cut it off with his sword? Because he's a giant. That is true. Look at the tiger next to him. There's always a tiger. Compared to it. Why is there always a tiger? <laughs> hmm. 
Also, what's that thing on the right of him? Is that the dragon's head that he's ripped the tongue out of? I don't know. It looks like it. I think it's, a shield. it's upside down, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is supposed to be the dragon. I think it's the dragon. It's poked through the wall. It's like there's a oh, crack yeah. in the wall, and it's been pushed. Its head's been mm. smashed through the wall, and it's ripped its tongue out. That's nasty. Also, look at the size of him compared to that town below. That guy's massive. <laughs> I don't think it's the scale. No. Well, there's not. There's a, no. There's, there's no banana. banana. <laughs> <laughs> no banana for scale. Yeah, so those are examples in history of fossils which inspired other myths. That were proven to be false as well. Yes. Okay. So, third theory I've got is that of human psychology. Perhaps the image of a dragon is one that people recognise innately. After all, dragons seem to represent a collage of all the crucial attributes of apex predators. They have the wings Mm -hmm. of birds of prey, they have the jaws and claws of large mammals, such as big cats, and the constricting bodies of snakes. Dragons, therefore, are a response to the human fight or flight instinct, as our ancestors who instinctively avoided these traits were more likely to survive. It doesn't, however, explain the positive connotations of dragons in Eastern mythology. So what do you think about that? I mean, it does make sense, because they literally, in theory, they are apex predators. The way they're depicted in a lot of places, yeah. And, like... Yeah, again, like it's our last comment with the it doesn't explain the positive connotations about them. Yeah. Although I've got two thoughts on that. The first thought being if you're in awe of a creature, you might carry more respect for it, therefore you might almost worship that. So mm-hmm. that idea mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. you've attributed the best of the best to your emperor is something that you would heighten because obviously your emperor the idea is that you're you're under the guidance of your emperor and your emperor is looking out for the for everyone. And therefore, if you associate the best of the best of all the creatures with the best of the best in somebody's character and the role that they're fulfilling, then you're going you're gonna to hype up that as well, aren't you? Yeah. And then the second thought is then conversely, because that's been hyped up so much and associated with the emperor who's had an empire the Western countries have then been more fearful of it and therefore it's the divergence there has been split into one which is hyped up for hmm. the good of a populace and one that was hyped up negatively for the the idea of it being the enemy. Yeah, that makes sense because like, like in a lot of like folklore or fiction or even real life actually as well, people get compared to bears. Yeah, you know, or the strength of an ox. Like, strength of an ox, like, yeah, like yeah, classic yeah, yeah. Phrases, yeah. Basically, I agree with what you're saying. Um, I, I think it's quite a good point because, it, especially if you're like, if you have an emperor and your people are like spreading rumors to uh, opposing countries or factions, whatever, and you're like, oh, yeah, we, our emperor has the blood of a dragon. It's like, oh, shit, really? What, what's a dragon? But then it's like, no, he's got a blood of a dragon in him. And, that's quite scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the the sort of the main point behind this theory is that because it's human psychology, which is passed down through natural selection, this is the reason why the dragons are in all the cultures, why they try to send cultural boundaries. Okay, okay. If that makes sense, if I if I explain that, just explain that again. Because it's innate to people, it's passed down through natural selection. This is the reason that dragons transcend cultural boundaries. It's the reason why they appear in all the mythologies of all different cultures around the world. Yeah. Because people innately fear these traits of animals, and then they put them together to make a, a dragon, basically. Yeah. That, that's but, quite interesting. But again, if it was something that was... Why would it be one specific creature? Well, the, the point being that the creature has all the characteristics of of all the creatures that people are scared of, scared yeah. of like big claws, big teeth, snake-like appearance, um, everything else you said. I can't remember. Probably spines and stuff. Yeah. Hmm. Part of me just thinks though that at some point there should have been a divergence. So, like, yeah, I I completely get what you mean in terms of it highlights the apex predator, but why does every civilization look at the same creature like the thing that i'm wondering is when you spread it out across the whole world why is there not something that's got 
the features of a dragon, but isn't called a dragon? Like, why doesn't it have the strength of a different animal or the the feet of a different animal? See what I mean? Like, you, you'd yeah, expect I at think... some point for there to be a slight divergence, and not everybody would think of a dragon as being a dragon, but you might think of, instead of the head of something with lots of teeth, you might think of... I don't know, the, the head of something that's got maybe tusks, for example. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you're saying. A... I, I think the the reason that isn't the case is because it's innate to the original human ancestors who lived in the same place. Okay. And they all have a fear of snakes and big cats and birds of prey because they were the animals that were around during that time. Oh, and as that population have spread out, but it's from the same source. Yes. Okay, I mean, that makes more sense. I was thinking that there, surely there must be more cultural influence, but actually when I make that statement, there is. That explains why the Chinese have got five toes yeah, yeah. and long necks and the Koreans have orbs that they carry. And then why the Western dragon obviously maybe looks like exactly how you imagine it on the whale, the Welsh flag compared to the uh, the traditional Chinese dragon for Chinese New Year. Yeah, it's the, the fact that fear of snakes tends to be ingrained in people even if there aren't any snakes where you come from so for example people in britain might have a fear of snakes even though we we have what two species of snakes you, you you're mm. probably never going to see one in your life and yet we innately have a fear of this creature of this animal yeah what about scorpions though same thing. same thing yeah. same principle isn't it yeah, and spiders scorpions. spiders as well and drop bears there's a scorpion called a Death Stalker scorpion, and it's terrifying. <laughs> sure, it is. For your birthday. Probably could. It's just a scorpion. Probably buy one illegally online. You have to make sure to feed, feed them water every day, though. <laughs> or it'll kill you. Otherwise, how is it going to eat you? Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you think? Do you lean more towards one of those theories, or do you think it's a combination? Just remind us the three theories as yeah. titles so that we can reply. So, to modeled after real creatures or phenomena. Fossils and human psychology. I reckon modeled after, personally modeled after real creatures, um, not phenomenons or anything like that. Because you said about the comets and stuff like that. I don't think yeah. that. I think the most likely thing is that there is a animal that is now extinct that resembles or is what, for example, uh, the Chinese ancient Chinese were referring to as dragons. I mean, that leads more to the fossils discussion, though. Yeah, but there's no fossils. For me, hmm. I know it's a bit of a cop-out. Like, I definitely agree that it has to be all three. Like, realistically, it has to be all three. But I actually really like the fossils one more. So I like number two much more. The main reason for it being, if you are an ancient civilization who are not particularly advanced, stumbling across maybe a cave or something like that that happens to have fossils fairly close to the surface and you see huge animals with evidence that there were uh, that they were dinosaurs with the fossils being disturbed. I can definitely imagine how you would look at something like a Diplodocus, Diplodocus, however you say it, that's been distorted for you to think that that looks like something that maybe you're seeing there and then, which would probably be a snake. And if you're seeing the really long neck and you're seeing a snake and every time you see that snake, you run away for the fear of being killed by it. But you always think back to, oh my God, that animal had legs. Maybe I just can't see them because it's on the floor or maybe it's not using them because it's not chasing me in the right way. I definitely can imagine how you would make that connection between between that and that fear factor would continue to escalate from that point. Mm hmm. The mm -hmm. problem I have with number two with the fossil stuff, though, is it's a chicken or the egg problem. Like, it's hard to yeah. see whether dragons were thought of first and then the fossils backed up the claim, or whether dragons were thought of because they found the fossils. Yeah, I get that, actually. Yeah, like the earliest recorded findings of fossils was 2,000 years before, 4,000 years before the, you know. Yeah, but that's, that's what we got evidence of. Exactly, yeah. So they, yeah. Yeah. But with, like with the Cyclops, it seems to be quite cut and dry that Cyclops were thought of because they found the skulls first. Whereas with dragons, yeah. it's more a uh, question either or against. Mm -hmm. But I'm. So what do you think? I think it's 
probably a combination of all three. I lean more towards modeled after real creatures and the psychology stuff rather than the fossil stuff, but I think the fossil stuff backs up the first two theories. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense? Okay, yeah. Okay. I think perhaps the psychology stuff was the original source for the creature, and then its appearance has been altered based on seeing real-life creatures. Mm. Yeah, because we, we, it could have just started as a description. You know, like, I know obviously it's a child story, but you know the story of the Gruffalo? Mm-hmm. That's literally the story of, I don't know, eight or nine different animals, I think it is, all made into one creature that everyone goes, oh, yeah, it's really scary. And then the storyteller in that doesn't believe it's real and then actually finds it. Hmm. If you take the Gruffalo as a story and you go, the dragon has the claws of a panther and the scales of a snake, and you keep going through that story, it's really easy to come up with a dragon, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And descriptions of dragons, especially early on, tend to be like that. They tend to be like just specific traits mm. that could be separate. So it's hard to put the whole picture together of the animal because often they don't say the size or they will say the size, but they won't say uh, whether it's got wings or not or whether it's got claws or how many toes mm. it's got. Like, So the moral is, describe the dragons better, people. It's really hard to tell what you're on about. <laughs> Yep. I think it, it could be all three as a combination, like you guys are saying. But I am quite stuck on the... So you said that my theory kind of backs up the fossil theory. I'm not necessarily... I don't necessarily agree with that. I'm saying that I think it's more the the animals that were around at the time, not the fossils they found after. The animals they found at the time, or that were with them at the time, domesticated or otherwise, because you can't really... Well, you can domesticate a tiger, actually. That's Joe Exotic would. Yeah. If, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you, what, what if there were animals native to that area that if we found fossils of them now, they wouldn't re- resemble anything like what we believe to be dragons of what is developed as dragons? Mm-hmm. But what if they're similar? What if they were like Komodo dragons? What if they were like lizards or crocodiles? Because it's not hard to believe that there would be an animal. That is similar to what we think of as a dragon, if you look at other animals that are still alive now. I mean, even a bearded dragon, like the little lizard mm-hmm. things, they look a little bit like dragons. Yeah. But I suppose for like for the bearded dragon, again, chicken or egg, the description come from a dragon and then we stumble across an animal that we thought looked oh, like Oh, I, I guarantee the, the, the idea of the dragon came first. Oh, really? I'd uh, say they saw a bearded dragon first. I was going to say the same. Well, how... When did we discover bearded dragons? It doesn't, well, I guess that, not... and then it doesn't matter because then it's officially. When did we officially exactly, discover bearded dragons? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I think that mm. this is the hard bit, isn't it? Hmm. I feel like we could argue about this forever. <laughs> yeah. No. I. I think we we're arguing arguing similar points, and so we're just helping each other refine mm-hmm. what we believe. But like, I am quite convinced that it'll be from a genuinely real animal that is now extinct or is still alive, but has just been interpreted differently. Yeah, fair enough. Mm-hmm. Maybe maybe they had something like a Komodo dragon and they decorated it to look like a dragon. They painted it red, for example, and then strapped a flamethrower to the back of it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a stretch? Is that... <laughs> just stick a, stick a firework on top of it. The... Yeah, and it went to the moon. <laughs> the tra- That's why we haven't got it anymore. <laughs> that was the comet. There, there you go. There we go. Ah, it's all coming together. (laughs) (laughs) Families of a Madman is currently available on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify and YouTube. All the links are available on Twitter at Roan Podcast. That's R O A M Podcast. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.